we're back, and this is the final uh, session with Marilyn Waring, who's talking about if women actually counted, how the world would be very different. Is this, so, is this the last session? Or this, I thought this was the third session. This is the third session. We're going to do all of them, the remaining ones. So today we're going to find the best solution, or just, we're going to catch a glimpse of the hole, as she calls it. Okay. All right. So... Um, so just to remind us, last time, or two times ago, we talked about uh, what is considered production, and it turns out to be only material war production, and it's only what is counted in market transactions. And last time we also found out that, uh, according to her calculations, it costs, well, the world paid about $700 million per person to be able to kill them uh, over the 40 years between the end of the Second World War and when she wrote this book. And uh, she wants us to imagine a world if we had spent that money on something different than trying to kill people, or having the ability to kill people. So she, uh, so she wants to talk about the next. She wants to talk about the economics of reproduction. And for her, reproduction is everything that is not market. Uh, it's all the things that make the market possible. So, for example. Um, she looks at uh, here. She looks at six non-market aspects of market transactions. So these are six things that exist in the world that facilitate market transactions, but which are not counted. So first is biological reproduction, which of course includes pregnancy, birth, motherhood, and so much more. It's all reduced to welfare, and within the economic system, it is measured in cash payments. So often the baby bonus, for example, uh, that's all that, that motherhood or biological reproduction is worth. But how much is your education? How much is the, um, the ability to give birth? How much is having a mother worth? It's not anywhere near, in her mind, uh, what we are, the value that is being imputed to it by the, the system that we live in. The second is labor force reproduction which is measured in terms of fertility and is most often expressed in reproductive rights, or as she likes to ironically say, more like lack of rights. So what is the cost for a woman to get pregnant? Loss of career, loss of uh, advancement and all that kind of stuff. Our system of national accounts um, penalizes women, more often than not, for getting pregnant. And we may have made some strides in the world today compared to 1986, but we women still pay a heavy price for this in terms of the market, the world market, or in terms of market of transactions. Third for her is the reproduction of relations of production, which includes the perpetuating of women's roles inside and outside the household, which include lower pay, lower benefits, and lower job security. So, uh, while there's been some gains since 1986, predominantly the least secure jobs, the least paying jobs, tend to be women's jobs, or uh, tend to be habituated by women. A subset of this includes the reproduction and enslavement in the form of female infanticide, preferences for male sons, um, mater uh, mater maternal mortality, and the custom of women eating last or least and women sexual slavery and marriage, uh, which may be less common in our developed world, but are still common everywhere else in the world. This is connected also to the fourth non-market aspect of market transactions, the reproduction of relations of reproduction. What can be noticed, according to her, is especially, um, is that it's always a transaction, but rarely is it a market transaction. So the real value is not really being paid, is what she's claiming. Because all of these things that women often do keep the economy and the market going. Fifth, from her perspective, is the reproduction of the social relations between men and women, which includes religious, legal, cultural beliefs and practices that define women as property of men. And lastly, sixth, is the reproduction of the boundary of reproduction. It is, and this is her quote, it is the categorization and subsequent institutionalization of who does and doesn't and or should or shouldn't reproduce. 
and it's distinguished and characterized by colonization, neocolonialism, religious fundamentalism, and homophobia. So very cultural stuff. Yes, that you can miss all this kind of stuff. So she sees these as things that keep the market alive and going, make it allow it to go from generation to generation, but which are not counted. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, Sorry, I just lost my notes here for a sec. Okay, so looking at those uh, those six aspects of the uh, of what supports our market, then she wants to look also at the in the actual market. So she's looking at how these uh, the economics of reproduction occurs in seven markets. And she wants to take a look at the technological and medical market, the legal market. The social and cultural market, that's three. The labor market, the sexuality market or sex market, and social welfare and the propaganda markets. Those seven um, are particularly influenced by, or we can see more egregiously, the injustice in those seven markets. So, looking at the first one, the technological medical market. And she's talking here about surrogate mothers in vitro uh, fertilization as examples of the misvaluation of women's work and women's and women in general. She points out that at the time of her writing in, in, in 1986, in country after country, the laws favor men's work, not women's. So if a woman miscarriages, and this is a surrogate mother we're talking about, prior to the fifth month of pregnancy, the physician who examined her or prepped her, he gets paid. It's almost always a he at this time. Uh, the physician who may have inseminated her, the psychiatrist who screened her, the lawyer, uh, who arranged the survey, they all get their money. But if the woman miscarriages, miscarries, she doesn't get her money. So what we're saying is that what men do gets paid and what women do doesn't get paid. So all, all the miscarriage, well, she, I mean, she doesn't get, pay, get, get paid whether or not she miscarriages anyway, whether the birth is successful or not. Well, the doctors get paid whether the birth is successful or not. Right. Lawyers get paid. And she sees that as, um, as, a, as a result of patriarchy and the separation uh, and the individualization, or sorry, the market division of labor, uh, which is an injustice. So yes, you can get your job done before the final thing collapses or fails or falls apart. You get paid and it's not based on the finished product. So, uh, contemporary thing would be say you're building a car and uh, you screw up nobody notices until the car is sold should you still get paid well possibly possibly not you see um if you can be attributed if blame can be attributed to you it's attributed to you but in this case what she's saying is that because she's a woman and because she's the last one on the line she's the one who gets the blame and has to pay the price whereas the others don't so if the world sets it up so that a lawyer can be discreetly paid for a particular service, it doesn't matter on the outcome of that service. But the woman can't be um, separated and the lawyer can. There's an injustice there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, get, I get where she's going. Okay, so uh, that is a setup in the world today meant to protect men's jobs and less so women's jobs and there may be progress but it's only minor progress in her in her perspective she also points out that uh in the literature on the subject sperm seems to be worth paying for but eggs are encouraged to be donated so this again is in uh, survey motherhood right and uh biologically we know that sperm are really cheap and they are quite expensive so there's a total role, or I guess, reversal of values there, right? Oh, maybe. Sperm is valued, but but the egg isn't. Yeah, according to her, in 1986, um, you could get paid for providing sperm. Men could, but women were encouraged to just donate the egg. To to, 
to donate their eggs for in vitro oh. fertilization. Interesting. Yes. So uh, that's another example from there. So a second one would be in the legal and insurance markets in which men's bodies and men's body parts are privileged over women and women's body parts. The author gives a long list of cases demonstrating this. In one example, she gives ironic praise to Quebec of all places where payouts for legitimate work-related injuries are actually equal for both men and women, men and women's reproductive organs. However, she points out that the irony is that prostitution and women's housework are not considered legitimate work, at least on Quebec in 1986, and therefore any damages suffered from rape, including marital rape, will not result in a payout. Yet if a man loses a testicle at work, he gets a payout. So sorry, you said prostitution and what was the other one? Housewife, uh, housewife being a housewife. Right, right. So back at the time, they, they claimed to be far ahead of the world in the sense that they valued male and female body parts equally. But in the technical details of it, where a woman is likely to um, have her sexual organs damaged, either prostitution or being a wife, like marital rape, they were not considered legitimate work. And so they would not get the payout. Whereas if a man got hurt at work somehow and lost a ball or something, he would get a payout. Wow, really? Yeah. So, the, okay, so, I mean, that, that's definitely uh, weird examples of our, our, I guess, our liberal bourgeois democracy favoring, yes. favoring uh, men in all kinds of ways. Yes. Now, <laughs> here's an even more ironic case. Another irony of the patriarchy, according to her, is in insurance, is that a widow more will often receive less insurance or damages from the death of her husbands than widowers get from the death of their wives. So here, when it benefits men that women's worth be counted, then suddenly they're worth more. And the ironic irony of it is that it's when they're dead that they're worth more. And she gives many examples of that. Does that strike you as a little odd? Uh, yeah, that strikes me as, um, I don't know if I, I would call it, again, I don't know if I would call it the patriarchy, though. I would, I would get back to the mode of production and um, how th that necessitates these kind of relationships between men and women. So I don't think she would deny that, that there is a, there's a capitalist mode of production here. But if there wasn't a patriarchy that was actually hurtful to women, then there wouldn't be these differences. Right, but you can't have capital like capitalism. Uh, patriarchy is a symptom of class society, and capitalism in particular. I think we reverse that. Patri patriot, sorry. <laughs> uh, capitalism is a new a new phenomenon in world history. But not patriarchy. class society. Class societies require uh, patriarchy. Yes, and class societies are much older than capitalism. Yeah. So the, the division of classes, including men and women, and, and the invention of property is where patriarchy comes from. She would disagree, I'm assuming. <laughs> um, well, she doesn't get that much into the origins of patriarchy. She just says it's, it's a fact of life to me. Yeah, of course, that exists. of course she does. <laughs> okay, the third market, the socio Social and cultural market relations of domination, exploitation, and virtual enslavement are reproduced through lower pay, lower status, fewer benefits, and less job security. This is the way that uh, reproduction of social and cultural relations is perpetuated. Again, we're talking about life's value. This also happens in the fourth, in the labor market. At the time of writing, the higher up the pay Stat, uh, the higher up in the pay or in status or in technical levels, the more white men dominate. Bosses hiring managers and HR professionals who are mostly white tend to hire men who are very much similar to them. This perpetuates the inequality. 
Mm-hmm. Well, there's been some gains recently. Uh, it's still the ruling class. In the sexuality market, this is the fifth one, uh, there is an inside and an outside delineating by a reproduction Repro- delineated by a reproduction boundary. Prepubescent people, elderly people, celibate people, heterosexual women who demand reproductive freedom, same-sex lovers, especially lesbian women, are all outside of the reproduction boundary and carry some stigma in our culture. I think this still pretty much continues even today. The stigma comes from choosing, according to her, from choosing to separate sexuality, that is especially pleasure, from reproduction and therefore challenges the patriarchal notions of women as property and the, and the reproduction of patriarchy. That's why there's a stigma, she claims. And it's deep, as in it will exist, despite the fact that there's no law, there's laws suggest uh, make it illegal to discriminate based on any of these things. Right? Um, have you ever felt that stigma? What stigma? That, uh, okay, well, if that uh, prepubescent elderly people, celibate people, heterosexual or heterosexual women uh, who demand reproductive freedom, same-sex lovers, uh, especially lesbian women, and anybody else who's outside of the reproduction boundary carries stigma in our culture. Well, I mean, I don't know if I can feel it since I'm a, a man, a straight man. Okay, I meant it in the sense that not personally, but uh, say you had a kid and you find out that they're one of the marginalized groups. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. We would encourage them, but we would recognize that they would have a harder time in our life, in our world, than if they were straight. For example. Right. She's she's talking about um, well privilege and, and oppressions and stuff. Yeah. So it's very much still with us this uh, this stigma that's still there. Sure. And she gives another example: the economics of breasts and breastfeeding. All right. The economics. Yes. All right. It has a very warped sense of values in the world of economics today. Breast milk, for example, is the best thing in the world for a child in terms of health, cost, and availability. And in many cases, for the women, as breastfeeding allows for uncriticized rest and the control over the resumption of ovulation. Right? This, and this is especially talking in the third world. But in our market society, one would think that there should be a market, but fortunately, she claims, there isn't, for breast milk. Since market activity is the counting standard of the United Nations system of national accounts, and since there are more market possibilities for the manufacturing of infant formula and for women in the workforce that create economic that is countable value, then the uncountable benefits bestowed by breast uh, by breastfeeding, the market for breast milk will not likely expand beyond subsistence. So she's basically saying that um, because of the way we count things, it's better for the economy that women buy baby formula rather than that they breastfeed their kids. Well, okay, I, like that's all true, but to me, this is why she needs to read Marx because, okay. you know, she's, you know, breast milk, I, it, yeah, it totally makes sense that uh, in capitalism, it wouldn't be um, valued because you can't profit off of it. Um, or you, I mean, or if you can, it's a, to a very small extent, you mm-hmm. are, are you profiting off of anybody's labor time there. Right. Uh, I mean, it, that's, that's reproduced, uh, in, in the social reproduction sphere. Um, I mean, and that's the same, of, I mean, it's the same reason why hemp is ignored by capitalism as an energy source and as a, as a, a way to produce uh, goods and services, well, not services, but goods. Uh, because it's not profitable enough. It's, it, it grows freely. I mean, it's like our marijuana. It took so long for capitalists to, to catch on to that because, I mean, anybody anybody can grow it. Mm-hmm. And if anybody can make some. So it's more it's more to do with the mode of production, again, than it is the patriarchy. Well, in this case, she's saying it's basically the national system of national accounts. I mean, we can make it valuable, but we just don't. But it wouldn't be profitable. Oh, we can make it profitable. How can if we make- change the system? But that's part of what uh, the end of today we'll be talking about, how we can make anything we want profitable. Okay. <laughs> okay. But fortunately, in our system, it, even that doesn't work. But she also points out that 
even breasts themselves, do have a market productive value in advertising, in pornography, in the garment industry, and in the cosmetic surgery market. Yes. Where they reflect male society's preferences. Yes. Okay. So, in the uh, sixth one, in the social welfare market, women's poor or poorer health or the neglect of women's health is deliberately reproduced by the economic and political system. Or, so, for example, for many governments, a cut in health care shifts the burden from the government sector back to the household. Right? That's, you, you're getting you this? So, Sorry, say, say that one more time. Um, for many governments, a cut in health care shifts the burden from the government sector yes. back to the household. Yes. So instead of it being in the books as a liability to the government, now it becomes an unpaid liability to the caregiver at the house. Yeah. At the home. This is a classic way of making money in a capitalist system. Um, so since most health care is provided by women, for women anyway, and to children and men too, women take up a lot of the slack when funding for social welfare is cut. This helps make cuts to healthcare and education seem not too serious and rather, quote unquote, intelligent, because it shifts the burden to the hidden economy, legitimizing bad policy as being successful, because, hey, it balances the books better. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I have personal um, experience with, with exactly this, because, like, um, they wanted my, after my dad had a stroke they didn't want to keep him in the hospital anymore so so they sent him home and they did give us some services but you know not enough he needed kind of full-time services but so basically my stepmom had to be the you know psw the nurse um mm -hmm. so the government wasn't paying for it that's right and it looked like the cost for books better yeah so shifting the cost and or effort from the market transaction to the hidden economy is a time-honored way to maximize profits in business. It's called efficiency gains and or cost cutting and is most effective when demanding more work with less pay per unit of realizable value. In economics, this technique is called externalizing costs, where someone is made to put in necessary work or effort without getting paid. And the best example in recent times, of course, is Facebook, which grew rich by externalizing content generating efforts. Right? I mean, who gets paid to put stuff up on Facebook, right? Uh, and that's what everybody wants to see, is what people have been putting up there. Well, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the users themselves are generating the content for Facebook to profit from. Exactly. Data. Yeah. That's right. And, and, those, uh, those professions that are affective, as in their caring professions, like teachers and healthcare professionals, are routinely victimized by the externalization of costs. And he sees this as the system designs this to happen. Okay, so the seventh market. In the propaganda market, we have literally hundreds of cases in which the science says that a particular course of action or policy is the best in terms of the policy's stated goals, but which are routinely devalued. So, for example, in third world countries, a girl's education has been shown conclusively to contribute far more to the health and welfare of the family than male's education. Yet it is girls' education that is first cut in budgets during recessions. Um, Similar science-based arguments can be made for women's access to birth control, housing, amenities, and so on. And the fact that men in the system still privilege war, defense, and male needs is an indication of how much propaganda, or I guess, um, yeah, I guess it's propaganda that's trying to tell us that, hey, that's not really what we need to be doing. Or capitalism needs to maintain a underclass. Yes, but it's still... Uh, okay, so it's kind of a convoluted argument. So you're right, it needs to do that, but it doesn't claim to do that, right? It says we want to solve poverty, so we have a war on poverty. And what does it do? It creates a poverty management industrial complex instead of actually solving the problem. That is and profit off of that complex. Yes, exactly, and it keeps it keeps people in poverty essentially. 
this is what the system is designed to do. So that's a completely irrational from one perspective in the sense that, hey, we want to eliminate the, the policy stated goals, right? We want to eliminate poverty, so we're going to have a war on poverty. But due to the system of national accounts and all the, uh, sub, all the things that it touches, it's not irrational that this industrial complex develops. It's, in fact, the logical outcome of the system that we have now. So it's not actually irrational. It's just that the values that set it up were irrational. Right. If you can, if you can see how much we're paying for death and for destruction and for uh, all these really crazy things, you can see that it's in the national accounts or the system of national accounts that creates these incredibly uh, crazy ways of doing things. And if we were to fix the values at the top of it, we would be much closer to um, a better world. Well, well, we'll see when, when we get her answer. Okay. So, um, before we get to her answer, I'm going to talk about two ameliorations that she once uh, that she once thought were solutions, but now, at the time of writing of the book, 2020 or 1986, uh, she felt that these were would uh, would make the world a better place but they would not solve the underlying problem. So, uh, and this is, this is part of her development, first as an as a economist, then as a parliamentarian, then as a professor um, and author. So as she's gone through these stages in her life, uh, she's, she's changed her mind a few times, but she still believes that these would be ameliorations and they might be easier to get than uh, the full solution that she has at the end. So the first thing that in the amelioration would be simply to impute value for women's unpaid work. Right. Um, we, we do this all the time already. Um, so it's not like it's new, it'd just be on a different scale. So we impute values for the black market. It's extremely easy to do. We just put the number in there. The black market in Canada is this big. We're going to adjust things as a result of that. The debate would be how much to impute. Okay. So, um, and the way this would be done essentially would be to give everybody a basic income guarantee. Uh, the basic income guarantee would be the market mechanisms count the mechanism that the market uses to count for work. Now, she says this would be an amelioration. She has no doubt about that. However, it does still keep material war production as the um, as a big value at the, at the top. She also it sees also, this. It also maintains class relations. Yes, so it, that's why she says this is an amelioration, but it's not uh, It's not the solution. Right, okay. But it might be easier to get than the solution. She also sees that um, the problem with the big, of course, is that, well, one of the big problems, one of the big problems with a basic income guarantee is that it doesn't distinguish between um, good and bad, or sorry, I should say, uh, good and less good or values in the provision of um, effective labor. So there could be a good mother and there could be a bad mother. They're both providing a necessary service to the economy, to the to keeping the economy going, to um, building a better world, but they're basically being paid the same because it's very difficult to distinguish the difference between a good mother and a bad mother it's um, hard to quantify, you mean? Yeah, hard to quantify is my better way. The market is actually really good at doing these kind of things, but in there, that creates that that necessitates the upper class and the upper class. So, for sports heroes or for uh, sports stars, you can actually quantify very well how good they are at, say, hitting a ball or scoring goals and all that. Stuff. And because of that quantification, you can actually pay some more than others it's less likely that that should, should be done, let alone can be done, with motherhood. So a pig is, a, is an improvement, it's an amelioration, but it's not the end goal. It will just make the world we have now a little bit better off. See, I think, to me, under, under capitalism, but I mean, I guess she, she thinks she wants to, I'm assuming, move on to some weird utopian system post-capitalism, but under this system, it, it almost sounds um, dystopian to, you know, start quantifying women's work 
um and like the quality of of that that work yeah too. so she's, she's not advocating that that's what okay. she sees as a problem with the basic income guarantee so it's a better it's better than what we have now but it will have its own problems as well it will create new problems and in this sense uh Slavo Zizek talks about that also at some point uh what the problem okay. is a better thing but it's it's not going to be the, the it won't solve all our problems and it will create a lot more but it would be a better thing right so the, that's her basic, that's her first one now, or that's her first reason why a big is not enough by in and of itself. Um, we can't really know how much to be imputed. Um, and another uh, shortcoming is that it leaves out the environment and how we value the free gifts of nature. So uh, the second amelioration that she deals with to deal with the fruit gifts of nature and to consider the, the creative or destructive nature of consumption and production. So in the world today, when we calculate the, base, the, uh, the GDP of a country, we had everything, but not everything should be added. And uh, she gives credit to a guy named E.F. Schumacher and his book, Small is Beautiful, which I happen to have right here. And which someday we will do. Okay. <laughs> he, his, is he an economist as well? He is an economist, yes. Uh, she credits him with this idea that um, some things are destructive and some things are productive. This destructive, productive dichotomy does not exist in GDP calculations. Everything is just added. But what he suggests in this book and that she really likes is that we should be subtracting from GDP costs that are um, detrimental to the process. So if, um, so say example, uh, nuclear energy. We want to have uh, electricity, clean electricity, um, to, to uh, light up a city. And we do that for 20 years. below. That's why right? governments have to do it. Sorry? Sorry, nuclear isn't profitable though. That's why governments have to do it. Yes, but even government should be following this very basic logic. Is like they can they create a lot of jobs in nuclear, right? yeah, and uh, they create a lot of technology, and it's it's got a whole bunch of spin-off effects, and they see this as positives, positives, positives. But what she's what um, she's suggesting that uh, um, E.F. Schumacher is pointing out is that whatever benefits that we might get from nuclear, say there are spin-off benefits here and there that and, uh, we actually light up the city for uh, twenty years or something like that. They pale desperately uh, by the cost that's going to be required over the next 10,000 years to store and maintain in a safe location the nuclear spent fuel. Right. That cost should be subtracted from GDP or from the counting of what's valuable. This is where he gets that, that, that destructive, productive um, value judgments. GDP is always additive. So you wreck a forest and then you replant it. Both of those are added. What it would be better to say, we can harvest a forest and then you subtract the cost of replanting it from the benefit that you get from cutting it in the first place. Then if it's profitable, it might be worth cutting from that forest. Does yeah, that make sense? I get it, but I okay. Maybe I think what she's doing is putting the cart before the horse. So she is talking about why the way we count things is completely wrong and um, destructive, which is absolutely true. But it it's it's something that you couldn't you couldn't have a capitalism with without that. I mean, count. It, it, you would, oh, you uh, it wouldn't be capitalism otherwise. Well, like, so you, you're right. You wouldn't be capitalism to throw it first in order to get to a system that she's talking about, I think. So if you define capitalism as the need for unlimited growth, yes, you're right. If you define capitalism well, as a market, she would be. You would, she would say you're wrong because markets are not long around long before capitalism. But we associate markets with capitalism because markets have ex expanded beyond their proper role in society. Well, that, that's that's an error, though. If, if she's defining capitalism as as markets, or she no, she's saying that markets are good. But nothing wrong. 
nothing wrong with markets necessarily, but capitalism is the at, at you know it's the mode of production at base that it's less about markets. You could in, you, in theory you could have a capitalism without markets. Um, so what, sorry, how do you define capitalism then? What's the uh, the defining term or defining definition um, of capitalism for you? It's it's uh, the mode of production where um, you have a capitalist who um, extracts labor time beyond, uh, sorry, extracts surplus value off of um, a laborer in exchange for for pay, and but that that laborer is never getting the full value of of what they're they're uh, working in. So there's always been they labor don't have control over what they're, they're, they produce. So there's always been laborers, uh, as yeah. well as slaves and stuff like that. But we wouldn't call the Roman Empire that had laborers as well as slaves um, capitalists, would we? No, but the, the the difference is is that the capitalist is, is extracts surplus value and reinvests that in um, his cap in his business and for to, to upgrade. Uh, um, technology and machinery and etc in order to become more productive in order to get more uh, uh product productivity and surplus value out of his the labor i think the, the defining point there is that without limit continues on forever because i'm pretty sure that um, they did that in ancient world but they just didn't do it forever um, they're the potlatch a little differently the motor like they weren't looking to profit there they were they were looking to uh, or sorry, they, they weren't looking to reinvest in sl under slavery and, and, and feudalism. I don't know. I think they wanted to, and perhaps not to the unlimited extent that capitalism does today. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a minor point in the sense that uh, the world we live in today being optimized and the, uh, the, <laughs> the search for e incredible efficiencies to unlimited production defines capitalism today as opposed to um, the unlimitednessness of it compared to in the past where there were physical, tangible limits to how much food could be stored, for example, or how much um, material production could be kept alive. Like if they're building a surplus number of canoes, what could you do with them? They're going to rot if you don't use them kind of stuff, right? If you don't maintain sure. them. Um, we, we have developed a sense of obsolescence and fashion that didn't exist in the past. Um, that kind of stuff mm has -hmm. changed the system in a way that uh, reduces value as opposed to increases value. That's a different thing. So what all she's basically saying with regards to um, the accounting aspect is it's never been done this way before, as far as she knows, um, where you take away the bad that comes out of an action from the proposed good. And uh, in the book, Small is Beautiful, he's talking about non-renewable resources as being like consuming the capital of your business. You never want to do that because that is like you're, you're dissolving your business essentially when you're doing that. You want to work with operating um, funds or with profit, but not with the capital of your business because if you sell the means of production, you're out of business. And that's what we're doing when we sell or when we use non-renewable resources. They may be a huge supply and they might last for another hundred years, but once they're gone, they're gone. And renewable yes. resources, on the other hand, would count for much more if we counted this way. So right now it costs um, it costs very little to uh, take uh, oil out of uh, Saudi Arabian oil lake. Uh, and so it's cheaper than, say, building um, a, a solar wind farm or something like that. And so because it's cheaper to do that and you're not counting the fact that hey you can't do that forever but once you burn that it's gone you're not taking into account um the, the future cost yeah the externality of it so if you were to do that then the cost of oil would be much much more expensive and probably renewable energy wouldn't even be profitable for it for may now. not even be except in like very extreme cases like maybe you need rocket fuel or something like that to get to the moon or something but at least then it would be you would have comparable and you would actually be able to consider more realistically the actions that you're going to do so how much again uh, one of the questions that she asked in the very beginning how much is clean air worth to you well right now you have to rent clean air 
figure out how much it's going to cost to fix the clean air, and that's the value of clean air to you. At this point, what she's saying is, no, we would have to take, we would have to, we wouldn't have to break it first. We would have to say, this is where it's, this is, if we do, say we, uh, say, uh, we want to go 10 coal fired plants or electrical plants. We figure out how much pollution is going to be put into there and how much it would clean to do that and then subtract the cleaning cost from the proposed benefits of that and then see if it's really worthwhile or not. But we don't do that. No. We only look at, hey, we can generate electricity with this. That's great. What's the cost of that electricity to our health, to our environment? Subtract that from the benefits of the electricity, and then it may or may not be valuable or worthwhile. That's what this is supposed to do. It would lead to a whole set of new um, arguments, qualitative arguments about what we should be or should not be doing. Because right now, the way things are right now is, do you make money? Yes, do it. In that way, do you make money without, say, hurting whatever is valuable to us in our home, clean air, fresh water, that kind of stuff? It's not, and you don't do it. So things would be produced very differently, and a very different amount of things would be produced. Is what the claim, this claim would be in this case. Right. So uh, to make it more technical, um, the national accounts GDP calculations would should further be divided not into just income and expenditure columns, but creative and destructive production and consumption of goods and services. Then we subtract the destructive from the creative and the debates that this accounting change would bring about would focus on a new boundary, a creative destructive boundary, which is similar to our current debate on a production boundary, but qualitatively different. Instead of asking, is an activity productive or non-productive in the market from the perspective of war making or potential or whatever a particular business happens to be in, we would be asking, is such and such an activity creative or destructive on net? And this would be a major value change that she sees as absolutely necessary to save the planet, but also um, to improve even our quality of life in the first world. Yeah, I, I, I still think this could only be only accomplished under a po in a post-capitalist society but we'll, we'll, we'll let well, her see what her answer is <laughs> so because we're we we sort of do this already on a very limited scale she sees these ameliorations as relatively easy i mean they don't require revolutions we're already doing them to some degree um we can actually what, like, expand them like are we talking like cap and trade kind of thing what are we talking here well no we've already got about we've already got uh categories in which we consider whether something is an expense or an income, right? Income or expense. Yeah. Um, just add two more categories. Right, but I, I think that would get, get in the way of profitability too much. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the whole point of it. it. It actually gets to the real heart of what is profitable without the externalizations. So, um, which is what we sort of want. Which is, but again, not, which is going to be not much. Well, in the end. You, no, there'd be a huge change in value. I mean, a lot of the things that we do right now would be clearly seen as not productive, even though they appear productive now. Right, right. And a lot of things would get a lot more expensive if all of a sudden you... Yes, and by the way, and there's a good, and there's a reason for that, and a good reason for that, uh, because part of the reason things are getting cheaper is because they're not lasting as long. So at one point she points out that what is better for us to pay five times more for a washing machine that would normally last five years, if it's going to last a hundred years or to keep buying one every five years. So yes, things would expand, would be paid would, um, in this, in this system where we count the actual costs, uh, if things would be more expensive. Yes. But they would also last longer because now there is an incentive in the counting mechanism to make things last longer. So that and hurts that the rate is, of profit there. Well, it may reduce the rate of profit. That's not a bad thing. Well, no, of course it's, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Especially if you're actually saving the world and everybody else. So um, you buy a washing machine that's going to last 100 years instead of five years. But you pay five times more for it. Uh, so it, it'd be like the equivalent of buying five uh, washing machines. That would take you to 25 years. 
that production and the, the damage that you've done to the environment and to uh, the world as a result of um, buying one as opposed to over 700 years, you would have bought 20 of them. Uh, it's, it's immense. You have a huge savings. But there would be a certain permanence to what you buy instead of having disposable uh, everything. We would have less production, but it would last longer because that, and here's where she likes the market, because that's what the market would do. It would benefit those who actually produce the better long lasting product. Whereas the, the way the system is produced now is benefiting those who have fashionable trends and that get out of fashion very quickly or things that have a decision obsolescence. If everybody can be convinced that washing machines should only last five years uh, instead of 10 years, that's an improvement in the GDP of the country because people will have to renew those things every five years instead of every 10 years. Right. That's what our system has now. You change the system with this particular uh, notion of positive, uh, productive and destructive growth, and suddenly the market will move it in the direction of which you will have things that will last longer and forever. Because oh. that's what would sell better. The market would move to Okay, well, all right, I'll so, buy it for yeah. now. So, <laughs> the market, uh, there's no such thing as a free market from her perspective. It's all dominated by the rules, regulations, laws, and customs of uh, the society. It's, and, the, and the system of national accounts is the overarching document, you might say, that uh, informs pretty much everything that is in at least the rules and laws within a society, maybe not the customs. But it sets the customs because if, 10, if uh, 50 years ago we all expected washing machines to last 20 years and today we expect them to last five years, that's required a customized change over time or a custom, customs change over time. Now we're expecting to have washing machines only last five years. From a capitalist perspective in today's system of national accounts, that's progress. That's a good thing because it it further uh, increases production and profits and all that stuff. And she's saying, I'll well, change the system and you would get a very different outcome, but you'd still get your washing machines. Well, the Soviet Union made long lasting washing machines, or they made things to last because they weren't, they weren't in a, in a market. They were, well, okay, she briefly talks about uh, the material production system, which was the name that the Soviets gave to their system, and it was opposed to the United Nations system, but it also had war production and was based on the Nazi one as well. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't, it was, it was like, it was slightly different, yes, and, um, but it wasn't fundamentally different, is what I think she would say. And the slight difference is, is that, hey, they got into space first. They did develop a bigger army, Navy, and uh, well, maybe not Navy, but Air Force, uh, and bigger and better and more weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear weapons, than the West ever did. Uh, and they have, they're a smaller country, like population wise, they're a smaller country than um, the United States, right? Uh, they're only a little bit bigger than Germany. So, yeah. how was it that they did that? Well, it's their system of national accounts that helped to do that. It's the same. It's the same kind of question and answer that how was it that Germany, a country that was just defeated and went through hyperinflation, was able to retool so fast um, and develop an army and a navy and an armed force that uh, took basically the rest of the world together to put down? Uh, it's got to do with the national system, the system of national accounts, according to her, and uh, the Soviet system was meant to do that too. So, Okay. Uh, those are the two ameliorations, she says. Both of them uh, don't actually eliminate the fact that uh, material war production is on top. So now, the final chapter of the book, which she calls Glimpsing the Hole, um, she offers an alternative or what really needs to be done to fundamentally change the world for the better. Uh, and she credits uh, a Finnish activist uh, with the creation of this model, which she expands on. The name of her, and I'm going to bitch you this because I don't know how to pronounce Finnish letters, is Hilkaka Piatilia, maybe. And uh, she described um, three concentric circles. Uh, the center one is the biggest one, and then there's a thinner middle circle and a thinner 
motorcycles. You can imagine like a target, but with the central one being the biggest one. And it's for a reason, as we'll see. So in her diagram, she describes the non-monetary part of the economy as the free economy, since it consists of the work and production that people do voluntarily for the well-being of their families and or for pleasure without receiving or who they would do it if even if they didn't receive pay for it. Okay? This is all the stuff that we do, like raising kids, educating our kids, teaching them life lessons, um, and doing things for them. Uh, she believes that, these people, that this group should get a basic income guarantee. And this is everybody in, this, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country. And the reason for her, uh, this is where she, um, uh, sorry, wearing is adding to uh, Petilia's um, theory is that a basic income guarantee would pay for all that, but it's just because everybody is in fact productive for something. We may not be productive for war making stuff. If we're not, those who are most productive for, in our system today, those who are most productive for uh, the war effort, in a sense, are the most, or relatively the most. Those who are paid, who, who do the least for the war effort, are paid the least. A basic income guarantee assumes, or she would say, assumes that everybody is, is productive. Whether you're watching cartoons, because you're you're supporting the creators of that uh, of that cartoon, or whether you're um, digging a trench, or whether you're writing software. You're everybody's doing something, even when they're sleeping. They're consuming they're, they're consuming mattresses and bed sheets at the very least. So everything that you do is in some way productive, and you should in fact be rewarded for that. That's where the basic income guarantee comes in. And she says that's the first circle. It, it covers. Uh, that we do normally for no free, for without cost. So this, this exchange that we're having here, uh, I'm not getting paid for it. I assume you're not getting paid for it. So we are, we would be part of that economy, the free economy that she, she, that she describes. This is the outer circle? This is the inner circle, the pretty inner big circle. inner circle. Actually, let me see. Do you have the diagram? Hold on. I can get it very easily. Ah, uh, yes. So you notice that the center circle is bigger than all the rest, right? Yeah. Although it's inside the other ones, it is actually, it should in volume be, or sorry, not volume, in surface area, I guess. Or right, area. right. It should be the biggest. It's the free economy, it says? She calls it the free economy, yes. Yeah. Because in our world, compared to our world, it's what people do for free. Right. So we should all get paid for our free economy labor. Uh, exactly. And stuff, and stuff. And that's where the basic income guarantee comes in. The second circle, she calls the protected center. It consists of production and work for the home market, for the domestic market, as well as public services such as food production, construction of houses, infrastructure, administration, schools, health, and communications. All the other stuff that governments do as well. This sector is in most countries protected and guided by legislation and official means. I mean, there's uh, rules and regulations everywhere. She says that is what it means in the protected sector. But here's, this, here's the fundamental difference. The prices in that, uh, in, the, in, the first, in the first two circles, the, um, the free economy and the protected services, are in one currency, one local currency in a sense. It's not an international currency. Okay. So uh, it's it's actually, and this is why it's part of why we call it, well, she's calling it protected. So it's independent of the greater economy of the world. It's not subject to the vagaries and variances of what's happening in the world. It is domestic and domestic alone. That makes sense. Say it again. Okay. Um, the protected sector and the free economy have a currency, a local, say, Canadian dollar. Right. This Canadian dollar is not usable in any other country. Okay. Right. 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 I remember this. And it's not exchangeable officially. Um, 
to anybody for, for this normal is kind of like Cuba. Yeah, in effect, wow. it's a little bit like Cuba, um, with a few a few, uh, a few other things. So um, she points out that uh, protected sectors where money is as a motive is used as a motivator beyond the basic income. Okay, uh, so people need, in a sense, to be motivated for money. This is where the market is also. So it's not only government, but it's also the market within the local domestic market. Um, when I say local, I mean at the, at the town level or at the national level, but not at the international level. Um, in this, people get paid for the difference in quality of their work. So if you happen to be a lawyer and I happen to be a lawyer, we can both be productive as lawyers. But if you win more cases, or you happen to be a better lawyer, you should get paid more. This is where the market allows for differences to manifest themselves and be rewarded over and above the basic income. Right, okay, I gotcha. All right, so she has a place for the market and it's here. Or she's got two places for the market. This is one of them, okay? Um, here, it's also where democracy or governments can impute value where they see fit. Now, we do this already in a very limited scale. Anytime we have a nonprofit corporation that's funded by the government that has a task to be made, we are imputing value. We're taking taxes from people, not letting them spend it where they would want it, and we are spending it on a particular task or goal that is deemed necessary or desirable by the elected representatives of that people. She's claiming that in this protected sector, this must become dominant. So it's like where nonprofits, the nonprofit sector, um, would become huge in the sense that we want them to do this. So we already have lots of nonprofits public health, the hospitals, these are all um, nonprofit things. We have um, uh, home-based housing in Kingston. This is like a homeless shelter kind of thing. Shelters in general. Uh, we have uh, walk-in clinics that are funded by the government. These things are viewed by the government as having value outside of the market, but which they pay market wages in order to achieve desired ends. She wants that done without the current system of national accounts. And the way they're doing it, uh, but her own system of national accounts decided by the people by putting whatever they feel is important for their society at the top. So right now, material war production is the most important thing, and so we get the system. She's saying, what if we were to choose something different? Imagine if we were to choose education, and that became the top thing. And we set up a whole set of uh, nonprofits. So universities were, for a long time, nonprofit institutions, right? They are now businesses. That's an unfortunate thing. But we could do that. We could, anytime we step a nonprofit in the world today, we can do that and have it as a central, um, most important thing in, in our economy by imputing it directly into that. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Imputing it. So um, when we create value in our system, uh, we created by mark by market transactions. So instead of market transactions being the imputed value, we say uh, the end result of having everybody housed is an imputed value. So if you can get that done, you get rewarded with this much money or this much uh, this this prestige or whatever we want to give them. If we say that everybody needs a washing machine, and we impute that into saying if you can provide a washing machine that lasts a hundred years or something like that, or whatever. Uh, Targets we want, it's done by a market. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, yeah. So it's like, it's almost like contracting out uh, to the free market. We would normally call it a free market, not what she calls a free market, what she calls a, um, a protected sector, to do a particular task. And then people, using their initiative, their um, common sense, their education, their values, or whatever, compete like they do today for those jobs or those tasks okay mm -hmm. so is she still leaving the 
capitalist like are these co-ops now or can they still are they still businesses where someone's profiting off of someone else that are competing for these these contracts or whatever or to build the best uh, it be like that. government? so that's probably the easiest way to imagine it yes but it would be all the uh, hidden ways that we see it too i mean how is it all of a sudden that um as a result of uh of a plague or of a pandemic we have the ability to shut down the economy that's very easy to do in our system because it's designed essentially as a totalitarian by a totalitarian dictatorship nazi germany to facilitate a war um so we are at war with the pandemic in a sense the and suddenly we've we've decided that we want local production of protective uh, personal protective equipment and suddenly companies all over the place are retooling to do that we can do this now but without, unless we change the top of that, the reason for war production, um, you're just going to be sort of like shifting um, pieces. What she's saying is that we're shifting direction by changing the material war production to something else. And imagine what you could be. Say you could spend $700 million per person over 40 years for space exploration. You would have something like Star Trek very soon. Um, instead of war, right? We probably wouldn't have the weapons that we would have right now. The point is that if we did that for justice or for education, um, for anything that we want to imagine, the possibilities are amazing. We, uh, like, it's, it's hard to imagine because it's, but it, it's what we're doing now just redirected. Right. So, okay, so, you could, so it could be co-ops and it still could be capitalist firms, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. When you say capitalist firms, again, it depends exactly what you mean by capitalist. So the notion of the unlimited re, uh, reinvestment of, of stuff for a particular end, in the case of profit, yeah. it was, necessi was necessitated and made possible by a system of national accounts that only counts um, market transactions. Imagine a system of national accounts but instead of but, that, but capitalism has existed before a system of national accounts, it became different. Uh, and in, uh, after, after 1911, when the, that was when that thing happened, that's when the market, which was part of society, started to dominate all society, and we're still it's still dominating more and more of it. Uh, that that shift, that change, is as a result of what is counted, and what was counted is market transactions. So imagine if instead of counting market transactions, we're counting how many people are homeless. And you get paid, the fewer there are. Today, it's very easy to count how many dollars are exchanged between people. That's what the whole system is, was designed to do in 1911. But it wasn't done that way before then. So if we were to count, say, for example, how many star systems we've explored, that's where people would put their efforts and they would get it done because that's what happens when you create uh, an incentive right and when not only when you create an incentive when you create an incentive by counting that and not counting something else so when when they moved from excise counting which means they counted the number of chickens or the number of buggies or something like that because it was too hard to do that and only counted the sale of those things it simplified things for the economists, but it meant that uh, they weren't counting the number of buggies necessarily anymore. They were just counting the transactions. Never were they ever counting how many children or how well you raised your children. She's saying, why can't we do that? So if you raise children that can achieve these kind of things, say, and you list them, say, according to your society's purposes, and you count that, you've got a, a fundamentally different system of national accounts than if you're counting monetary transactions. Whatever you count will blossom over time. And so what she's saying is that we just count something different than monetary transactions because money is not the source of all value. In fact, that's the problem with our current no, system. Money isn't value. Labor is value. Yes, but we're not counting labor. We're counting transactions right. of labor right. in money. So let's say we counted labor instead of the transactions in money. We're always working in a sense, all of us 24 hours a day. So now we can nuance that by saying, what are we working for? And we're going to impute value for those who are working 
to do X, Y, and Z. These are the top three things that our society has decided are important. Let's say we want to house everybody, feed everybody, and clothe everybody. Once that's been achieved, you can change those three. That's the beauty of, the, of a system of national accounts when it's done properly. You can change the central tenant, or the central aim or goal of it. But it hasn't been changed. In like since the since the Second World War, so I think I think the argument would be that um, Second World War. I thought you said it was 1911. 11th when they they started changing it from excise counting, like of actual production, to monetary transactions. In the Second World War, not well, Nazi Germany started it. I guess um, maybe in the 30s or, or late 20s or something like that. But the U.S. to get into the war change their system of national accounts to make the war appear feasible. Well, right, but the, the U.S. was also in a depression. Um, so, you can I mean, a depression argument, by counting something different any time. I think the argument would be that this this was kind of a... The, the, there really wasn't any other, any other option. For capitalism to move forward, it would have had to start counting in this way. No, she would say no. Uh, there is no absolute necessity that anything happened this way. It could have been very different. Um, they made the case the, the reason that America got in, or sorry, was able to afford the war was because they changed the system of national accounts so that they could. They focused in on war material production and they never changed that. Then they imposed it on the rest of the world through the United Nations. If they had chosen something different, we might have lost the war, but it would have been something different. America may never have been able to enter the war if they had not changed the national accounts because the debates and the, the projections, the, um, the financial projections were showing, according to uh, Waring, that America could not maintain a war effort, let alone afford this war. It changed the, the system of accounting and suddenly it became very feasible. That can happen with anything, not just war. The fact that it happened with war and she noticed it and nobody else has is an accident of history. All right. Well, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll let it slide. <laughs> we'll let it slide, will you? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so again, these imputations are should be based on the legislatively value legislatively the values that are legislatively promulgated by the people. That's what democracy does. So uh, the. the Powers that be at the time of the Second World War changed theirs so they could get their war, and they were successful and they never changed it, and we're still living in that system. What people need to know is that we can change this at any time. We could, if we wanted to, change it at any time, but nobody even understands, or very few people seem to understand that it's changeable, uh, not just tweakable. I mean, we can tweak it, everybody's been tweaking it for years, but to change the fundamental aim and the imputation of what is valuable, that's, that can be done. And uh, we're already playing with with some of the elements of that, as we any day of the any day of the year. We're playing. We're playing with the elements. Yes. Uh, anytime we set up a nonprofit corporation that's funded by government taxes, that would be an example. Of doing that on a small scale. Imagine doing that on a large scale, like seven hundred billion per person scale. Yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, those are the two inner circles. Now, the outer circle, which uh, she refers to, where, oh, sorry, that's my place here. Um, okay, so the United Nations and National Council, this is where the whole life of society is geared to support this sector. So, large scale production for export, which is usually called the open economy. Piatilia calls it the fettered economy because it is fettered to the world market. The terms of this sector, the prices, the competitiveness, the demand, and so on, are determined by the international market. In other words, not the domestic market, not the legislative, not the democracy of the local country. In this, um, this fettered market, which is usually... Um, is the international market. We have free trade today. And this is the ideal that is taught in most economic courses. And it involves trading from one, one product from one country with competitive advantage to 
for another product from a different country with a different competitive advantage. And this is essentially a barter between countries. And both countries would be materially better off when they trade like this. But by introducing domestic currencies in our world, this we're talking about in our world today, the nations can expand the range of products that can be traded beyond the double coincidence of wants. So if uh, Canada's building, uh, or Canada has trees and the United States has cars, we can trade trees for cars and we count the difference in money. And uh, if we have a shortfall or a, or a surplus, we can go to other countries and buy different things. But eventually, but what's being transferred is some sort of value which is denominated in exchange rates of, of money. Now, this is a good thing to a point. Nations expand the range of products that can be traded by having a, a, their own currency, which is a good thing, so it improves the, uh, the amount of stuff coming into the country and the benefit of the people, but it also exposes their population to all the problems of the international market where they have no control. That's the point of having an international market. One country does not dominate everything, it should not. Um, from time to time it might happen, but uh, in the international market, it, there, there tends to be a diffusion of that kind of stuff to the detriment of everybody in, in a bad time. So for example, uh, right just last week, I believe oil prices went into negative territory because first of all, COVID and an oversupply and nobody's driving and all that kind of stuff. So people were, producers had to pay people to take their oil because they have nowhere to store it. This is something that the local, that, the, that our country, say like Saudi Arabia, could not control. I mean, they can try with OPEC and stuff like that. They can campaign up and get um, market control. But for generally, for most countries, they can't do that and certainly not in every market. So it subjects the countries to the whims of this market and it's very undemocratic. The way you insulate that is by separating the domestic and the international markets with two different currencies so that all the, that happens in the international market will not affect the people in their own country. So, so the Cuba thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, Cuba is a, is a partial example because they're also under tons of international or American embargoes and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's not an entirely fair one because it would be better if everybody's still allowed for international trade. Yeah. But it was fettered and separated from domestic trade. So if you are producing something for the external market, it would be, in a sense, um, marketly produced uh, through free, quote unquote, free enterprise in the domestic market, channeled through a government that tries to get the best dealings in the world. Uh, like this would be like the uh, late supply management or something, or uh, the wheat board in Canada was an example of this in the past. Um, well, getting the best deal and getting securing something that they need from outside to come back in. So if we have oil, say it's our sands oil, we sell that in exchange for something from a foreign country, but the denominated value of that is not the same currency that is used by the people in the country. Because if it is, then their standard of living, their ability to buy things and sell things is influenced by the non-democratic market forces outside their country. It also forces the local government, the domestic government, to um, follow the rules of international organizations, which of course are not, um, may not have the same values as the local people. They may in fact want to preserve the existing world system, and that may not be necessarily good for every country. Yeah. <laughs> It probably is. I would imagine some, well, a lot of the powers would want to keep the, the, the system as is. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of separating the domestic market from the international market is to keep the good aspects and protect the people from the bad aspects of the international market. So the international currency should not be used domestically and vice versa to avoid the lower, uh, here, okay, so the, the democratically chosen values of a particular society are usually more than just pure profit. There's something wrong with a society that says, we want to maximize profit. That's the capitalist thing, right? 
where, where a country might want or a people might want or society might want is like to maximize human longevity or uh, human health or um, the flatness or the uh, smoothness of streets or the quality of people or um, the the material fashion of the people or whatever it is, whatever, whatever they decide to do, it's, it's up to them. But if they're tied directly to the international market, then they can't do that because the international market has its own ups and downs and uh, forces at work that would hinder that. So to protect the international market, or to protect the domestic market, it's like having um, a breakwater around a, a port. You can have the storms out there, you can send your ships out there, but they're protected inside. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, uh, in this way, the values of the people inside the country, which may not be the same as the values of somebody else in another country, are allowed to flourish. And these are always higher order values. So, profit may be the, the goal of every corporation inside the country with it, and the profit is being directed towards the goals that are democratically chosen by the people there. That's how they make their profit. Whereas right now, it's directed at war making material or the ability to transfer over into that. And the more you are in, in line with that, the more money you make. What we're saying is, say, change it to education. Then those companies that provide the best education to the most people will make the most money. And those higher order values are the upside. The current system prohibits, literally prohibits, from being exercised. And they prohibits it because profit is the main purpose and that profit is directed towards material war production. Okay, so right now it's sounding a bit utopian because you know th these prohibitions you talk about, they're kind they're I feel like they're they're in the interests, they're serving the interests of the imperialist nations. Um, imperial, and imperialist blocks um, that are uh, profiting from exploiting the third world and the periphery um, yes. as is. So, so then, how how do you how does she anticipate we move to a different system if it's in the interests of the imperialist, powerful countries to keep it this way? So it may be in the interests of some of the people in those countries. Probably the, well, yeah, highest the, the capitalist price. class. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's not. It's not in the interests of pretty much anybody else. Correct. So as long as uh, we count out to these interests, um, which don't let us imagine anything different, nobody's going to rise up. So is she is she advocating kind of like I don't know what she advocates, but is she suggesting we can do this through electoral politics? Absolutely, we can do it. Uh, we can do it tomorrow if people knew what to do. It's like um, so we can we if, can vote our way into the the next the the perfect uh, uh, utopian system. So in theory, yes, but again, the problem that she sees is that nobody even imagines what we could do. So um, you you have five fingers and you've got a brain, so you have the you have the capability to program Windows. I don't know if you can or can't do that, but you do. You just, I assuming that you don't, uh, that you can't, um, it's because you haven't been taught how to do it. But had you had that information, you could do it, right? So, I look at this, the caveman looks at this computer that I'm sitting in front of and uh, thinks it's magic. I look at it and I know how to type and do things on it. The difference between a caveman and me working on this computer is that I know something. And that's the only thing that's preventing us from actually doing what she's suggesting because everything's in place. It's just we lack the imagination to actually understand what's happening. Or sorry, I guess we lack the knowledge of to understand what's happening and the imagination on how to fix it. And she's, in a sense, provided what we can do. Okay, so it's a problem of knowledge and awareness or, or consciousness, if you will. That's consciousness, issue. yes. Yes. But, yeah. So it could be could be a consciousness issue, but I think she's she's kind of advocating the wrong kind of consciousness, consciousness, or or maybe not a not, not the wrong kind, but a shallow kind, a kind that doesn't go well, uh, doesn't really address the. It, you, it, she still hasn't addressed the um, ex, exploitation at, at the base of 
capitalism. So, and, and she doesn't uh, address the fact that even I think Kate, even in her, even if we let's say we all got we all were educated enough and voted our way into the system, we changed the system of national accounts, we created these uh, spheres, these uh, donuts, um, these circles. Um, <laughs> you would still have a massive reaction from the bourgeois class to fight you. And not all, and even if you didn't, maybe, maybe you, let's say you, you managed to uh, conv convince them, they would all go bust because quite quickly they would, um, I mean, if, if you weren't getting subsidies from the government anymore, collecting rents or exploiting third world labor, uh, capitalism would fall apart. Uh, some aspects would, but it would be it. It would be a rebalancing of the economy in the direction that um, that democracy would want. So, one of the first thing that would be required would be a local currency and an international currency. The international currency would be to trade with um, Bangladesh sweatshops, for example. The companies that actually deal with that would get the ability to trade. So they would um, maybe put some money into a federal bank. The federal bank would then use the alternative currency to get that based on the value. And the exchange rate would be based on the values of the people. So if clothing were uh, in short supply in Canada, it would be very profitable to put in a little bit of domestic money to the government bank to buy international uh, Canadian dollars to trade with Bangladesh to get that in. Once we had a surplus of clothing, the price to get that money for that purpose would be going up, just like market mechanisms today of supply and demand. The difference being that um, as the market fluctuates based on supply and demand, we can decide what the value is to those fluctuations and in what. So, when we see that, hey, we're getting to the point where everybody's clothed uh, well for winter, we can start to charge more. Those who are newest, the, new, the newest firms in that direction or in that uh, field who are least capitalized would probably be cutting out of that and looking for somewhere else to invest their domestic currencies to maximize their value. Because again, there is a, a protected economy is where you get um, profit in a sense beyond the basic income but it's always directed towards or from i should say a goal that is socially beneficial the goal that we have in our world today material war production is not socially beneficial so by changing it to one that is more people would be bent would see the benefit of that nearly immediately and so would corporations so just right now in this COVID-19 uh, situation, there are corporations that were producing something, I don't know, maybe paper or something like that, who suddenly saw a greater value to producing face masks. So they retooled and did that. That's an example of a value change within our own system. And the free market, quote unquote, free market, uh, adjusting as a result. In well, search the free market of failed. The market failed. The government well, had to step the in. Market, so she wouldn't say that the market failed necessarily. The highest value of that market failed for this particular what do, you mean the, what do you mean the highest value? Material war production is not useful for fighting a pandemic. Well, it's, not, it's also not profitable for any companies to, say, uh, build up the store or, or hospitals, let's say. It's not profitable for hospital, hospitals to build up their uh stores of personal protective equipment and have uh you know enough nurses and beds on uh, on staff and in-house to be prepared for a pandemic Hos hospitals right. currently have to run at like 105 percent capacity um yes. to stay afloat yeah. whereas yes. yeah because because of cover the because of the because the, they're yeah because they have to run because a profit. The national accounts right now maximizes the search for profit and efficiency gains. And one of those is even applied to the government where they want to have the least amount of expenses. And so they 
and risk of fund hospitals, they put those pressures on those hospitals. Change that value around. And suddenly, having a surplus of beds and paid for that by the government and it's sort of legislated in there, that's a value that will be done because the money will be there. And that's exactly what's happening now. We've got like 200 extra beds that have become available and we're on the verge of getting 400 more at the uh, investment center. Um, they're just going to be there because we've only had like one person uh, who's been treated in the hospital for COVID. But we've got hundreds of beds. We're ready in that sense. Um, our capacity to fight I think they use fight, but our capacity to deal with this um, with an outbreak of uh, COVID in Kingston is very good right now, better than it's ever been. But if more than 900 people get sick at one time and need hospitalization, that's still going to beat us. It's still going to collapse our our, our um, healthcare system yeah. here. So we have retooled, we have reused. Like uh, nobody's skating in the in the um, in the um, in this center because we shut it down. We decided we're going to put that into a hospital. You see how we built it up and it's easily converted to something that we need. That's what the GDP is counting. And we can, instead of directing everything towards war production, we could just direct everything towards um, healthcare. And that's what we're, we're sort of seeing as being done right now. But imagine if we were to do that for education, for space exploration, or scientific exploration, or mining, or something, whatever value we decide to do. What if we decided to house everybody? Yeah, yeah. That's, this, we, we do everything that she's been saying in little bits and chunks and saying, yeah, we let's do this temporarily kind of thing. And everything is in a sense temporary. But nobody imagines that the material war production can also be temporary. And it should have been, it should have been stopped at the end of the Second World War. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I get it, but still, you, you, she still has the flaw that capitalism still ran, like, still required infinite growth and uh, profitability, um, which which requires human profiting off of uh, human labor power um, beforehand. Um, I mean, so, the character is different, but it's it, it still wouldn't it wouldn't it doesn't change the fundamental relationship, I think, at base and the need to to all, well, because you also have competition, too. So the need to to drive uh, labor costs lower and lower and uh, that, that point there, to, that need and that trend to drive labor and labor, lower costs, uh, labor lower and lower over time happens because you don't change the fundamental. So the longer you don't change that fundamental, say, material war production as the final goal, yes, that's the nasa, nasa, that's the natural inclination. However, so you change that the fundamentals be, be, long before it ever had a system, long before anyone had a, 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 system, a system of national accounts. Sorry, capitalism still had its own fundamental um, re, like relations. Long before there was ever any system of national accounts, any any accounts. No, national accounts have been around since the beginning of human history. They didn't, they're very primitive compared to the ones we have today. Okay, because our economy is much more developed. But what, here's how you how, here's how you raise the um, the value of labor. You change the the, uh, the central tenant or the central aim of the national accounts. The longer it stays in position, competition, which is not necessarily a bad thing, will reduce the per unit cost because there's competition. You change the fundamental thing, you have to raise the price of labor in the field that you wanted in order to attract people from the undesirable fields into those fields. How do you raise the price of labor? You impede it. So suddenly we do not like, okay, what happened with um, food stores? Suddenly um, everybody's scared of going to a food store and uh, there's workers who don't really want to go there. So what do they do? They increase, everybody got $4 an hour more, I think it was, or no, it's, um, Healthcare workers, they got a four four dollar an hour raise. Right. Um, food basics, they were telling me they got two dollars an hour raise. These are, right. Yeah, yeah. But because they, they need the people to be there, so you increase the desire for that by raising the rates there, and uh, like higher than anybody would have expected, I guess. In this case, uh, you want, and if you're still short, you raise it even more. That changes every time you change the central aim of the system. In order to do that, you have to raise the prices, you impute a higher value to it, and people naturally flock to that. And then, if you keep it there long enough, it'll start to decrease. Why? 
partly because you need to find efficiencies because you're competing with other people and you've actually achieved the goal. Maybe that's one of the goals that should be done instead of managing the situation. So then we wouldn't have a um, poverty industrial complex. Once the problem is solved, you do that again in a different direction. And you raise the wages again. You stay there too long, and of course it's going to go down. We've been in this thing since the Second World War. We've been in this particular paradigm in the Second World War. So of course everything's going to be going down. We change that. And suddenly, say we want to do more space exploration. <laughs> um, and you impute higher, uh, higher wages to those industries that do that. And guess what? People will move in that direction, and things will happen in that direction. Yeah, I'm just not. I'm, I'm not sure I can convince that we that we can democratically impute wages um, in a in a system where capitalism functions. So we've done it already. I mean, how much? Uh, how much is it? How much do you pay somebody to sit in a silo all day and wait for an order to turn a key to blow up the world? Well, that's government run, though. Of course, this is all sort of in a sense. All market is government run. Um, we call it a free market, but it's not really a free market because there are laws, there are standards, and they're enforced by the government. In many cases, I mean, if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to jail. They'll take your house. They'll, they'll shut down your business. Yeah, the state, if the you don't state, follow the, the regulations state. of your industry, you will be you will be docked pay. You will be shut down. In that sense, there is no such thing as a free market, and it is run by government. Um, banks yeah, are state heavily state regulated, state and they're called that free. Aren't profitable, but that have to get done. Yes, those things are are we have uh, we have things for that too. The nonprofit sector, right? And many of them are impeded by government by saying. We're going to pay you this much. We think you're worth this much, and we're going to donate this much money to um, your cause. So, for example, Kingston funds a company called Sustainable Kingston to help bring awareness to all the environmental aspects of um, what Kingston is doing. Why? Because nobody would pay for it in the free market. So, yes, we do both. And we should be doing more of both, in fact. Yeah, all right. In a system where there's at least two currencies, a local and an international one, um, yeah, and uh, the locally we should be able to democratically change the central aim of the economy for whatever socio, social, or desirable problem. I mean, if we want to build pyramids here, all we have to do is find a bunch of rock cutters, pay them more than doctors, and everybody will want to be a rock cutter, and we'll be building pyramids. Yeah, if you just if we decided that way, but that sounds like. In socialism, you can choose. You can say, "All right, we are. We want. We're going to pay this many labor vouchers for this much work in rock cutting." Um, democratically, you can choose that. Uh, I, I still don't think we you, you can do anything like that in, in capitalism. But well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll it'd, be, it'd be interesting to to try out her her uh, her theory her. her but we do. That's that's the beauty of it from what I've seen. She gives examples of how this is being done on a small scale in every country in the world. Right, but but in in every instance um over time things are like neoliberalism and austerity happen out of, almost out of necessity because there's a crisis of profitability. So <laughs> The government needs to kind of sell things off in order to um, increasingly in order to uh, boost capitals. Um, so two points on that. Yes, that is true in our world today. But it's also because we are the domestic market is fettered to the international market and the international market nobody has real control of. So we are we're like ships on a wave and we just don't have it. Separate the domestic from the international, and you protect the, the domestic from the waves of the international. Second, have um, changed the national accounts domestically to favor whatever value you decide, and the profit will go in that direction. Every time you change it, you will be raising the value of labor in that thing because every time, the longer you keep it the same, austerity, the price competition, all of that stuff will. Uh, will force labor costs down. The Marx and, and Smith were right when they said that um, it's a profit will increase in the worst kinds of society and there's pressure uh, to lower the cost of wages and uh, collect more rents and all that stuff. But if you change the reason for why everything's happening, everything gets reset to zero. 
mm -hmm. uh, reset to zero. Everything gets rebalanced in a different direction. All right. If you want to have that rebalancing, of course you're going to get that um, that socialist revolution. Sorry, say that again. I, I can. I didn't catch that. If you don't re if you don't rebalance it from time to time, in other words, select a different. Um, central focus of the economy, uh, you're going to get that communist revolution that Marx spoke of, where things just get worse and worse and worse and nobody knows how to change it. But you do know how to change it, you just redirect it in a different direction. Um, yeah, I don't think, okay, but how is she addressing the the, 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 the tendency, I think, yeah, tendency of the falling rate of profit towards... So again, that's happening the all the time, not, it's not a problem. That's that's how you what happens when you've solved the problem in a sense, but we've been doing this particular rate of profit drop since uh, nineteen the end of the Second World War. Well, we had in the nineteen twenty in the nineteen eighties and again in the nineteen nineties and in the two thousands, people would be making a lot more money today because the people would be moving into those industries that are desired by the government for the benefit of the people. So. Uh, this happens in, on a regular basis on the international market. So we are, we are we're at the, the beck and call of the international market. So oil prices go down, Calgary and Alberta suffer. Why? Because we can't control that. Those are the values of that particular commodity. We change that. They change it. So people and the oil markets go up. So what happens? People flood, go into Alberta and start producing more. We do that democratically, locally by separating ourselves from the international market with a different currency locally that can't be traded internationally. Then, within the local economy, we simulate the very same things that are happening out there in a way that's desired democratically. So say we have a surplus of oil for everybody from Alberta, we start, or say from Newfoundland or Saskatchewan or wherever it's coming from these days, and we have um, a shortage of doctors. So if we impute by paying doctors more, like in a normal economy, uh, supply and demand, you just say, we're gonna pay you more. <laughs> and people will naturally flood in that direction. People will leave industries where there's less money and say that industry, the oil industry, um, when there's a surplus, profits will of course shrink. So they will look to cut down on workers. And as they cut down on workers because by not paying them as much, some of them will leave. And as they leave, that's, they find better jobs somewhere else that better fits the social goals of the economy and the uh, the elect and the people and the people's will. This is happening. The difference is: should it be democratically or should it be um, at the whims of the international markets? Is that um, okay? So, so th she thinks we can get there democratically just through knowledge, and if we uh, we can vote it in basically and make return profitability. Through uh, through all these measures, and have a more stable society without crises. Uh, well, there's always going to be a crisis because nature just gives us pandemics from time to time. I mean, um, crises of uh, profitability and accumulation. Yeah, if can we change it, that gets rebalanced. Okay, so it's all, it just requires rebalancing of the yes. system of national accounts. Uh, yes, that would be the simplest way to put it, but the system of national accounts is, of course, much bigger than just one document. But yes, essentially it would be the same. Okay. Yeah. And that is basically her solution to <laughs> all, um, all the world's economic problems. We live in a world because that has, that is completely rational based on a really poor, irrational system of national accounts. Okay, so um, all right, so we're so that's that's it for uh, Marilyn Waring and uh, fem, no, if women counted. That's right. So, uh, what, what are we doing next time? What would you like? So we could do. Did you ever get Fisher? I have not. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I could probably find you a PDF. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I have to admit that I've been um, finding it hard to read without a deadline. So well, I, mean, give give deadline. De I could give you a deadline. 
Hmm. All right, all right. So yeah, send me a PDF and um, I'll see what I can do. It's a, pr it's a pretty short book. Um, Where is it? Yeah, but then what else did you have in mind after? Uh, okay, so do you still want uh, politics or do you want... Um, okay, so uh, Byung-Chul Han, we can talk about um, violence, um, the swarm, beauty, love. Um, talk about religion, we could talk about... Um, all, from, all from Bok Chon Han? No, no, no. These are different people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Vegetarianism. Um, talk about Michel Foucault and uh, power. We could talk about, um, uh, about art. Okay, so we got, we got lots of options. Yeah, we got lots of options here. Okay. So you can it, right? Um, philosophyhammer.com, right? There's a there's a link there that links to all the pages that we've ever done. And right, there's okay. 72 pages of it. So all, all, all of those are good. What's that? All of those are good uh, options. All right. Well, we can talk about socialist art. Antonio Negri. Oh, he, so another one from him. So we started it before the COVID thing happened, and... Uh, yeah. Oh, so we started this at the actual um, club. Yeah. Did we do that recently? We did do that. We, oh, sorry. We did. That's why I just Yeah, we, we, we did do um, Art and Multitude. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, we did that. We did that. That's yeah. why it sounded so, so popular. So familiar at this moment. Um, did we do Slavo Zizek on violence? No, we haven't. Okay. Let's talk about him for violence next time. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's it for now then. All right. Thanks, Jeff. My pleasure. So right, in two weeks, we'll do Slavo Zizek and you'll get me a PDF and I'll see if I can get something done on that soon. Yeah. Okay. It's a short one. Uh, <laughs> all right. Bye now. All the best.